today we're going to, uh, so we've come to a point in our, in, our, in our series where we've discussed the need for prayer. Well, now we're going to discuss the effects of prayer. And you may say, well, Pastor, we've, we've already discussed that. Yes, you're right. You're absolutely right. We've looked at different scriptures where God has answered prayer. But there's a scripture in Mark chapter 11 and in many of the Gospels that I really want us to dig in a little bit and to get a little more context behind so that we can truly understand the power that's involved in prayer. Um, and so this week, that's what we're going to be talking about, the power of prayer. And as I've mentioned in my prayer earlier, that maybe some of us over the last couple of weeks, we've, we've thought to ourselves, well, is prayer really worth it? I prayed for this and I've prayed for that. And, I, and this person, I prayed for this person, but they still passed away. I've prayed for this situation, but the situation never got better. Is prayer even worth it? I'm here to tell you prayer is worth every single second. Amen. Every single callus that you have on your knees. Amen. What's that song before you learn how to, or you learn how to walk when you're on your knees? Something like that. And however that song goes, uh, I'm not going to sing it because I don't know it well. Amen. Is that okay? Um, every moment that we seek God in prayer is, is worth it. The sacrifices that come along with that. What do I mean by sacrifices? When we're giving up something else, you may be giving up the Super Bowl to pray God. Amen. That's okay. You may be giving up time with family to seek the face of God. You may be giving up food, fasting, as Scripture talks about. Fasting or, or something that you would normally do in order to seek God. Uh, this, this, there's, power, there's power in that. And so, yes, every moment that we spend in prayer is worth every moment, every second, every sacrifice. Again, I want to remind you this morning just how powerful prayer is. Uh, even though God may not have answered your prayer yet, that doesn't mean you stop praying. When I go to the Whataburger drive through line, amen? amen? And I order that nice number one, and I get some bacon on it because I like bacon, amen? Whataburger takes a long time in a drive through line, right? I don't drive away, I'm like, well, I gave it a shot. I'm sitting there waiting on that number one with some bacon, Amen? With hopeful anticipation that that burger is going to get there. And I'm going to rejoice when I put that burger in my hands. And mm, yes. that first bite, there's nothing like a Whataburger first bite, right? right. The mustard on it, that, that nice, fancy, spicy ketchup. Woo! Can I get an amen? Right? Yeah. That's worth waiting on. Amen? amen? We should be doing the same thing in our prayers with God. Yeah. God, this is my request. This is, this is what I'm coming to you for. This is the need that I have in my life right now. And if we got to wake up and do it tomorrow, let's do it. If we got to wake up and do it the next day, let's do it. Does that mean we lack faith the more that we pray for it? No, that just has a desperation that we have, right? God, this is the cry of my heart. This is my request. Father, what are you trying to say to me? What are you trying to, to, to tell me? What is it that I'm needing to wait on, if, if uh, even? Be anticipating that God is going to show up in a mighty way. So I want to encourage, this, encourage you this morning that based on Scripture and even what I've seen God do in my life, that praying to God is worth every second. And he always shows up in a powerful way. If you would stand with me, please, one more time. We're going to read from Mark chapter 11, verse 24. Mark chapter 11, verse 24. The scripture uh, is not on the screen this morning. I apologize about that. It's in the back of your bulletin, though. Um, no, it's not. You can just listen to me. Amen. Is that okay? Sorry about that. Mark chapter 11, verse 24. This is the word of God uh, for us today. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Father, thank you for this day and thank you for the reading of your word today, Lord. I pray, God, that as we, um, as we're seeking you today, Father, as we're asking revival to start in our church and in our hearts and in our lives and our community, God, that this scripture, that we would believe that you are already doing it, God. Father, the things that we've been praying for for some of us many, many years, God, we would believe that you are already at work in it. God, I pray that you would help us this morning. I pray that you would speak through me today. God, let the thoughts that are said today be yours and not simply my own. We give you all the glory and honor. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And so uh, Mark chapter 11, verse 24 is a scripture, is a verse that we have to look at the context uh, so that we can better understand what exactly is written. 
here. If not, then uh, we might get upset with God or possibly even lose faith because God didn't give us that Porsche or that Lamborghini or that boat or that house or that plane or that new whatever that you've been praying for, right? Lord, I need a new car, okay? There's a nice car here for $10,000. Well, Lord, I want the $50,000 car. But there's a nice car here for $10,000, right? You understand what I'm saying here? When we get upset with God over because it's not what we specific, well, not what we asked for, right? It's not what we wanted, if you will. We need to understand that God is, is still at work in these things. But this, this scripture, we got to understand the context behind it. And so midway through Mark chapter 11. So last week, just to kind of help us out a little bit, last week we talked about John chapter 2 when Jesus comes in and clears the temple. Uh, and so in Mark chapter 11, the beginning of Mark chapter 11, so Jesus comes in, held as king, right? At the beginning of the last week of his life. Jesus, uh, or his earthly life, I should say. So he comes in and he's held as king. He said, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest, right? And so he goes through the, through the city on a donkey. And then the Bible says that he goes straight to the temple uh, after this great entrance, if you will, that takes place. Mark does an interesting thing because Mark focuses more on a fig tree than he does what takes place in the temple. And so last week we talked about how when Jesus comes into the temple, what does he do? He destroys, he basically drives all the money changers, right? He flips over the tables and sets the, uh, uh, the sacrifice animals. He sets them free and, and he starts scolding all these people because they made his father's house what? A den of thieves or robbers when God's house is supposed to be a house of prayer, right? And so they've, they've, they've skewed it. We also talked about last week how since Christ is now the head of the church and, and we now live in Christ, that means that we are now the temple of God, amen? That it's not a building, that it's a people, it, it's a movement, it's, it's Christ dwelling in us is what makes us the temple of God. And so we went all the way back to 2 Chronicles when God says, what does he say? I will be looking for your sacrifice. And I'll be hearing to your, I'll be listening for your prayers, right? The Bible says he'll honor that. Right? If we humble ourselves and we seek his face and, and turn from our wicked ways and actually describes how he'll honor that prayer. So it's pretty awesome. And so here Mark picks up kind of in a similar way, except this time he focuses on a fig tree. How many of you have ever eaten a fresh fig before? Mm, hallelujah, praise God. My aunt, uh, she's going to be with the Lord now, but when I was a kid, uh, she had this fig tree, and she may have had a couple of them. I can't remember. But I would help her in the summertime. And by help, I meant stand there and watch. And so she would go to till up her garden, right? And she would have that old tiller that would basically throw you if you didn't have a good grip on it. And here this lady is, you know, just grabbing it and going along and tilling up her garden. She stops one day, and, and I'm digging through the dirt, trying to find some worms and hoping that she finishes so that we can go fishing, right? Amen. Amen. It's the whole reason I went over there. I don't care that you're tilling up your garden. I'm ready to go fishing. Hey, Mary Lou, right? So anyways, I'm over there playing in the dirt, getting some worms together. She finishes up, and she reaches up, and she pulls a, a fig out. She breaks it open. She begins to eat it. I'm like, that looks pretty good. Let me try one. So I had it. Mm, some good stuff, right? Then she went home, and she, she made some fig preserves. You ever had fig preserves before? Man, that'll change your life. God is good. Stuff is great. Yeah. And so here Jesus is when he says that he's hungry and he's looking for something to eat, as it says in Mark chapter 11, and he sees this fig tree from a long way off. I can't help but to think Jesus is like, I'm fixing to eat a fig tree. I'm fixing to eat a fig, not a tree. But I'm fixing to eat a fig. I'm excited, right? The hunger and, and, and thirst in, in Jesus' body is just starting to well up in him. And then when he gets to the tree, what happens? There's nothing there. He looks at the tree and there's no fruit. So then what does he do? He puts his hand on it and he basically curses the tree. He then goes into the temple and does all the stuff that he did as we talked about last week. After uh, Jesus has finished doing what he did in the temple, the Bible says that evening they left the city, which is probably smart because Jesus just made a whole lot of people <laughs> mad, right? So they left the city. And uh, the next morning, the Bible says, as the disciples were going to the next place, and as he and the disciples were going to the next place, they passed by what? The fig tree. The fig tree is now withered. And so within a 24-hour period-ish, 
Jesus curses the tree, and by the next day you see the results of that curse, right? The tree will never bear fruit again. And uh, I imagine Peter, right, says the other disciples saw this, and they began mumbling to each other. And I began, uh, I just have this sense that Peter probably said something, right? Don't you get that sense that Peter probably opened his mouth, and instead of inserting his foot, he just spoke, Right? And so he said, wow, Jesus, I wish that, you know, I'm ready for breakfast, but you went and killed the tree, so now we have nothing. Maybe he was hoping Jesus would bless the tree, and they woke up the next day and be full of fruit. But instead, there was, there was nothing. Jesus then goes into this, and it's interesting because Jesus talks more about the fig tree than he did about cleansing the temple. If you go back and read Mark chapter 11, there's about one line, one verse, where Jesus talks about what happens in the temple. But there's a whole paragraph about that fig tree. There's a whole paragraph about that fig tree. And so Jesus then uh, basically tells the disciples, have faith in God. Again, we're talking about the power of prayer this morning, right? Talking about how powerful prayer can be. Somebody much smarter wrote some of this commentary that I'm going to share with you today. So just keep that in mind. Uh, so this commentary writer says this, Jesus urged the disciples, have faith in God. Faith that rests in God is unwavering trust in his omnipotent power and unfailing goodness. Amen? This trust that God, that Jesus Christ is asking us to have in him and in God, faith that rests in God is unwavering trust that his omnipotent, or that in his omnipotent power and unfailing goodness, that he is still at work. Jesus said, so we're coming up to this, they're, they're continuing to walk. They probably get close to the Mount of Olives. And so we're putting this scripture into context here. And then Jesus says, whoever says to the mountain, meaning the Mount of Olives, which is probably what he's close to, uh, representing an immovable object, what does Jesus say? Go and throw yourself into the sea. Literally, uproot yourself, be thrown, get rid of, be moved, literally, and be thrown into the the sea, probably the, the, the Dead Sea, which is visible from the Mount of Olives. And if you believe in that, it will be done by God. Amen? What do you say? The faith of a mustard seed, right? Move mountains. We're talking about power of prayer, okay? And so the one condition is what? Belief. Have faith in God, right? What is he saying here? The stuff that we need in our lives, the things that we're praying for, no other person, no other thing on this earth can help us get to that point or help us uh, accomplish it the way that Christ can in its fullest. Does that mean we don't need each other? That's not what that means. That means we still need to come together. We still need to, to, to seek God together as a church, right? We still need to ask for help. Amen? amen. amen. And the more amens in that than a thought, right? A lot of us want to do things on our own. We, we just need to get that we can't do things on our own. And we need help. We need help. But Christ here is saying that this belief, this unwavering trust in God, that the petition will be granted, that our prayer will be granted, such faith contrasted that of Israel's faith, right? Here, they're given the Ten Commandments, and he's coming off the side of the mountain, and what is the first thing that he sees? A golden calf. Messed it up, right? Shatters the Ten Commandments, and then God goes into this whole spill about what's going on. But then he has faith in him again. He says, come back up and I'll give you those, these commandments again. Right? So he does that again. Israel's thinking, well, man, we're, we're, we're set free from, from bondage in Egypt. And this was a little beforehand, before the giving of the Ten Commandments. What are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What does God do? I'm going to feed you the whole time you're in the wilderness. What do they do? They complain about that. They're being fed by God Almighty. Amen? This stuff that in the morning is there, and by a couple hours after the sun comes up, it's not there anymore. And it's good for six days, but on the seventh day, it doesn't show up. Come on now, only God can do that, amen? Right. Uh, time and time again, Israel gets in this, this bind, and God shows up and, 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 and radically does something in their life. But for whatever reason, they still want to keep trying to do things on their own. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Right? Yes. Sounds familiar. So this lack of faith, if you will, this lack of belief, uh, the Israelites displayed some of that. 
And so this, this, this condition that God gives, that Jesus says, is this unwavering trust in God. Therefore, because believing prayer taps God's power to accomplish the humanly impossible, Jesus urged his disciples to believe that they have already received whatever they have requested in prayer. I'm going to say that again. Therefore, because believing prayer taps the power of God to accomplish the humanly impossible, amen? We know that we can't do this on our own. We know that we can't help our son, our granddaughter, our kids. We can't help them on our own. We've tried and we failed somehow. We've done something that they didn't like. And for whatever reason, they're mad at us. And so there's nothing that we can do to help them get to where they need to be. But we're sure enough praying and believing that God's going to do something in their life. As a matter of fact, we're supposed to have the belief that he's already going to accomplish or that he's already at work and accomplishing it somehow. Amen. That's the faith that we should have in God. Faith accepts it as good as done, even though the actual answer is still in the future. Just because God hasn't redeemed your child yet doesn't mean you stop praying for him. Amen. Just because this community is not where it needs to be, spiritually speaking, doesn't mean we stop praying for it. Amen. Because I'll be honest with you, when we stop praying for our community, this church ceases to exist, okay? When a church stops praying for its community or being there for its community, the church is no longer a church. It's just a place where we gather and sing and listen to a guy talk for an hour. Hopefully not an hour. We'll see. You know how God leads, amen, right? Faith accepts it as good as done, even though the actual answer is, is still in the future. Now listen to this. Jesus made the promise on the recognized premise that petitions must be in harmony with God's will. Right? So he's saying all these things that we understand the prayer and the petitions that we are praying to God. Ultimately, we're saying, God, your will be done. We'll get to that more here in just a moment. And if we're doing that, if we're praying this in harmony with God's will, this enables faith to receive the answer that God gives, no matter what the answer is. Amen. God, I want the Porsche. Well, you're not getting the Porsche. But God, I really want the Porsche. I'm sorry. Right. But God, this house is nice and and it's big and it's awesome. That's not the house you you need right now. You can't afford that house. You think you can. Right. Well, if I move this and I do that and I stop giving to the church, then maybe I can. Oh, I went there. I'm sorry. I went there. I apologize. Right. That's what we go through. That's that's the mindset that we have. Let's just be honest. Amen. We're all in the same boat. I've had those thoughts too, right? Come on now. Man, Tommy, it got quiet. It got quiet on that one. I shouldn't have went there, but I did. I'm sorry. This enables faith to receive the answer God gives. God is always ready to respond to obedient believers' prayers. And they can petition him knowing that no situation or difficulty is impossible with him. Amen? Amen? Again, we're talking about the power of prayer. God does things when people talk to him, when people acknowledge him, when people people bring their needs and their prayers and their petitions to him, right? Acknowledging that we can't do it on our own, but he can. As a matter of fact, acknowledging that, God, you are already at work and what we're praying for, we're just needing acknowledgement from him, amen? Or acknowledgement for what's going on. So we must have faith in God. Jesus, uh, but Jesus adds one more thing. This is the second part of the prayer, the second part of the equation to a powerful prayer, if you will, that a lot of people seem to overlook. And he says this in the very next verse in in, in Mark chapter 11, verse 25. He says, and when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them. So that your Father in heaven may also forgive you of your sins. That's the second part that we choose to ignore that we don't want to accept. God, I've got faith in you, but this person that did something to me 10 years ago, I, I don't know if I can forgive him of that. God, this, this, this situation that I'm in, and they wronged me and they, and they treated me bad and, and they, they stole my money. I don't know if I can forgive them for that, God. God is, uh, Jesus here is saying that, yes, we've got to have faith in God, but where's the forgiveness aspect of your life? I mean, you're coming to me understanding that I've forgiven you of your sin, right? Lord, forgive me of my sin. Man, where is that extended forgiveness and that extended grace that I showed you? Where is that to others? Man, that's hard, right? 
it's something that we all, I believe, struggle with at some point in our lives. No matter how strong our faith is in God, there's just some things that's hard to ask forgiveness for from other people. Because we're human, right? And we like to hold on to those things because we can say, you remember this? Instead of letting it go and let God have it, right? That's hard to do sometimes. The commentary goes on to say that a forgiving attitude, I think I put this in your bulletin, I did. A forgiving attitude toward others, as well as faith in God, is also essential for effective prayer. How do we have effective prayer? Believe that God is who He says He is, and forgive. In Matthew chapter 6, after Jesus gives us this prayer that we're supposed to pray, when He says, this is how you should pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, right? What does he say at the very end of that? And forgive others their sins so that the Father in heaven can forgive your sins. Man, this is the second time in the Gospels that Jesus does that. Believe in God, pray, but man, you better ask for forgiveness. Not just from the Father, but from those others that you've wronged or maybe that have wronged you and you've held a grudge against. Y'all didn't want to hear this this morning. You didn't want to hear this this morning, but this is where the Lord's leading us. We're talking about a powerful prayer. We're talking about a powerful answer to prayer, right? right? This is what Scripture is telling us that needs to happen. A belief in God and a belief that God forgives us. Also, we need to forgive others. We need to forgive others. He goes on to say, when believers uh, stand to pray... And if they have anything against anyone, a grudge against an offending believer or a non-believer, they are to forgive the one of that offense. This is uh, to be done in order that the Father in heaven may also forgive their sins, which are acts that sidestep or deviate from God's will. Divine forgiveness, uh, this is in your bulletin as well. Divine forgiveness toward a believer, this is good, listen to this, I'm going to say it again. Divine forgiveness toward a believer and a believer's forgiveness towards others are what? Inseparably linked. Because a bond has been established between the divine forgiver and the forgiving believer. What does that mean? Because God's forgiven us of our sins. There's been a bond already established. We've been forgiven of our sins. We are a new creation. We are set free from the bondage of this world. Amen? Amen. And because there's a bond between us and the Lord, the way that we go about and do our lives, the way that we go about extending grace to people when they don't deserve the grace in our eyes, right? right? Extending mercy to people when we don't believe they should receive mercy because of whatever it is they've done in their lives. Amen? Right? Yeah. You know, the church came together after 9-11 like never it has before. But man, we sure did hate whoever those people were that bombed us. You remember that? Yeah. There were prayers about that. God in those people. How dare we think we have the authority to do that? What makes the United States any greater than any other nation? I'm going there. I'm sorry. God loves everybody. Amen. God loves all the nations. Amen. Have we been blessed in other areas that they have? We have. And we thank God for that. We do. Man, God loves the Iraqis just as much as he loves us. Right? And so this bond that we have between us and God, man, aren't we supposed to share that? Are we supposed to live that way and forgive and show mercy and grace to those that don't deserve it? Amen? Amen. Right. To those that don't deserve it? And so, the divine forgiveness toward a believer and a believer's forgiveness towards others is inseparably linked. What does that go back to? Love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. You can't do one without the other. You cannot love God without loving man. And you cannot love man without loving God. Amen? It does not happen. You cannot do that. You can't do that. So this forgiveness, this true forgiveness, this true repentance of our heart, could it be that maybe there's some things in our life that we need to be forgiven of from somebody else or that we've wronged somebody? And even as a Christian, think about, let's think about this seriously for a moment. When we've said something to somebody, condemned somebody for something, when we ourselves... May not have been the best place either. Think about that. I, we're, we were all the same boat, right? Because we're all human in that aspect. Amen? Right. Most of us are human anyways, right? Yeah. Y'all didn't get that. That's okay. It's all right. They're inseparably linked. One who has accepted God's forgiveness is expected to forgive others just as God forgave them. 
So we can ask for anything in prayer and expect a powerful answer from God through a belief and faith in him and his will. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And through forgiveness of sins. Jesus says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive others who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, right? But deliver us from evil. For that is our forever and amen. And forgive so that the Father can forgive you. So what is this power in prayer that we're talking about? This power that we're hoping to experience one day. Earlier in this series, we, we talked about God showing up in, in a mighty way. When Elijah defeated the prophets of Baal. That's one of the most awesome responses of God that's ever been recorded. God consumes the offering in a fire, right? Looks up the water. We talked about that. Uh, when Daniel's life was spared from the mouth of lions. Think about that. A lion's den, right? Thrown in there, not expected to live through the night. But man, the mouths, the lions of the mouth were shut. Right? The mouth of the lions were shut, right? Nothing happened to, to Daniel. Elisha, when God asked him to do something quite strange, but God still healed the boy anyways. Stands up and walking. His mom comes in there and they're rejoicing. As they leave that house, imagine the people that saw this once dead child now living and breathing and walking. Amen? Those are some powerful responses to prayer. Those God showing up in a mighty way. God still does that today. God still does that today. If we don't believe that God is going to answer our prayers in a powerful way, why do we even pray? Does God still act like this? Does God still show up in these immaculate ways? Not all the time. Sometimes it's when we're in bed and he gives us a dream. And he shows us what we need to do. Amen? That's between us and him. Sometimes it's a conversation we have with a friend and they uh, give us some advice. and We seek God and we find it in scripture. I've seen that happen before. I've heard conversations about that take place. Right? God doesn't always show up in these mighty ways, but God is still working. God is already at work. Amen? Yeah. Amen. We must remember also that God is not magical. Right? God is not magical. He's not part of any fictional stories that we hope one day will come true. No matter how great Lord of the Rings is. That'd be kind of cool. Maybe not. I don't know if I want to live in a world with dragons and orcs and be kind of crazy. Be kind of cool a little bit though, right? Maybe not. Maybe not. As great as Lord of the Rings is, God, amen, is above any of that magical stuff. God is supernatural. What does that mean? The laws that govern this world and this universe, God created those things. Amen? Gravity. There is no gravity where God is. There is no inertia where God is. There is no momentum where God is. Right? God is above those things. He is supernatural. Right? And so when we pray to God, you understand we're praying to a God that does supernatural things. Amen? And so the way that he answers prayers, he answers in his own timing and in his own ways. And that's powerful. No matter which way and how he answers that, it is always powerful. When we hear stories of people no longer having cancer, that is the power of God at work. When we hear stories of people coming to know Christ for the first time in their life, that is a miracle. Amen? Amen? Amen. If you're a probability person and you, you like all that statistical stuff, just think of our existence on this earth as a whole. It's a miracle in itself. Amen? This is good. So when people are healed, when money shows up unexpectedly in our mailbox, when our sons and our daughters and our grandkids come to know Christ, we should declare them as miracles because that is exactly what they are. Again, God works in supernatural ways. These are all examples of God's powerful work, God's powerful answer to prayers all around us. This is the result of one accepting their constant prayer as good as done. Amen? The faith that we have in God is good as done because of their faithfulness and their forgiveness. And if we look back at the Bible, we can see some uh, other examples of God answering prayer in powerful ways. In Exodus, as Moses sought God in prayer, what did God do? He showed up in a mighty way. How? God said, raise up your stick and I'm going to make the water split. Amen? Amen? God, you want me to stand in front of your people and hold a stick up in the air 
And the waters are going to part and we're going to walk through a dry land. That's exactly what I told you to do. God, I want to make sure I'm hearing you what you're saying. You want me to take a stick and hold it up and you're going to wipe the waters apart. That's exactly what I'm telling you to do. What does he do? He holds the stick up in the air. God parts the waters. They walk through on dry ground. Yes. Amen? Amen? As they get to the other side, God says, drop the stick. What? Put the stick down. But put the stick down. He puts the stick down. What happened? The waters collapse on each other. And Pharaoh's best men are destroyed. The greatest army that, are, that was at that time is no more. In an instant. Yes. Amen? Right. God answers powerful pra or power, prayers in a powerful way. Fast forward to the New Testament as Jesus is traveling through Galilee and Samaria and Judea. The sick are being healed, right? That's right? The dead are being raised. The blind could now see. The lame could walk. And the demons fled as Jesus sought the Father and just about every miracle he performed. How do I know that? Because the Bible says that every morning, very early, what did Jesus do? He talked to the Father. Lord, I'm, I may not understand what's going to happen today, again, because Jesus was human, right? I may not understand or may not fully get where I'm going today, but this is where you're leading me, so that's where I'm going to go. And every village I come across and every person I come across, God, I want them to know you, Father, right? Amen. Come across a demon-possessed person, be gone. The demons flee, right? Come across this person that's, that's lame and can't walk. Come across this, this person that in this giant crowd of people where people are bumping into Jesus and this woman has enough faith to just touch the garment of his hem or the hem of his garment. She's healed. Amen. Faithful prayers. When the Romans and the Jewish leaders thought that they had gotten rid of Jesus once and for all from this earth, three days later, the power of God was revealed again and the answer to prayer made known publicly, Right? The ladies get to the tomb, and what happened? The stone's rolled away. It's empty. Except for Jesus' clothes. Amen? He listened to his mom, and he was a good little boy, and he folded up his clothes and put them where they needed to go before he walked out of that tomb. Amen? Why? Because mama said so. Why did he have the best wine? Because mama said so. Right? Three days later, the power of God, the answer of prayer in a mighty way, not only was he resurrected, but death had been defeated in that moment. Amen. When Paul and Silas were stripped, beaten, and thrown into jail because of their walk with God, what did they do that night? Man, they prayed. They sang songs. They worshipped God. What happened? Earthquake happened. Angels show up, and the shackles fell off their feet. The guard comes up and says, what's going on? And realizes it was God that had done this. The, guard, the Bible says that the guard fell and began to praise God. I want what you have, they said. I, 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 what is this relationship? What is this that you have that I don't have? Right? I want, I want some of that. These prayers that we pray, these, these faithful prayers, understanding that God can do what it is we're asking. And it's beyond that. It's God is already at work in what we are asking. Amen? God is already at work in what we are asking. God has probably prepared some things ahead of time for us to get and receive when we open our mouth and we finally say, Lord, I can't do this on my own. And he says, it's about time you figured that out. Here you go. Here's your next step, right? Here's the person you need to go to next. This person that wronged you in the past, you need to seek forgiveness. You need to tell them you're sorry. You need to get things reconciled so that I can give you the next step, right? So I can give you the next thing. Amen? That's how God works, right? Amen. These are all powerful moments in history, and God showed up in powerful ways, but he can do that still in our lives, and he does that still in our lives today. Before we close in prayer, I do want to ask, when was the last time that we experienced the, the power of God because of our prayers? You don't have to answer that out loud, but I really want you to think about that for just a moment. When was the last time God answered a prayer that you've been praying for for a while? Or have you been kind of reluctant to take that extra step and to truly seek the face of God and ask in prayer what it is that you're struggling with? Seek God in that moment. Or maybe you're asking God and, or you're bringing your prayer to God and he wants to work, but he's also saying, hey, you know this person that did this, you need to go and reconcile with them. Because what does Jesus even say before you come to the altar? Right? You need to go and ask forgiveness from your brother before you come and ask forgiveness from me. Yeah. Right? 
we need to understand that this forgiveness thing, it, it, it's this, this love, right? That's really what it boils down to, this love that, that Christ is showing us, that he wants us to show to others. It goes a long way. It's more than just doing what we're supposed to do. It's this, it's this forgiveness that truly, once we experience this forgiveness of God in, in this part of our life, it opens up for other ways for God to work in the other parts of our life. We say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. That's one thing. But he may also be saying, hey, there's this other issue that you've had with this other person that you need to reconcile so I can do this and so that I can work in this area of your life. Amen? Amen. Again, the greatest prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he ends with, and forgive others so that you may be forgiven. Mark chapter 11. Have faith in God that he's already going to do and that he's already doing what you've asked for in prayer. But forgive so that you can be forgiven. Amen? Right. Stay with me.